pretty if, perfect. Uh, it's just as long as the audio uh, comes through. Okay, I'm recording. Me, uh, message uh, if I need to switch over. I'll switch to mobile. Fair enough. Okay, uh, so I am recording. We got Sergey here. Uh, you know, I don't know, we, Bitcoin OG. <laughs> You've been in the space for a long time, and someone we've uh, we've crossed paths here and there. Um, never really had, you know, a, a, like a conversation conversation. So you know, just to call out the pink elephant. This is one of our first times conversing, and we just wanted to kind of you know go with the flow and and uh, yeah, just start there. <laughs> what do you say? That's good. Awesome, awesome. So why don't why don't we start with just like introductions, you know, and and feel free to take a bit bit of time as well, um, you know. Before, I, so I'm always interested in like pre Bitcoin, what people were up to, um, you know, where are you from? What do you like? What, are you a techie guy? Are you a business guy? All of the above, like, kind of what's your what's the lens that you were looking at uh, before you came into Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I'm. Uh... I think I'm a, I'm a mix. I mean, I'm, I went to engineering school and I've been uh, programming and building stuff. Uh, I mean, my, my first job was building websites uh, when I was a teenager and I, I did that as a side job all through high school and so on. So I've always been uh, doing that. I had a, I guess during my university years, I had this, uh, I think many people uh, have this uh, thing where I didn't want to be just a developer. Yeah, and I uh, uh, and I uh, went to uh, uh, to a master's program, which was engineering, but more like media technology. And I thought I was going to work in the media, uh, and because I had this uh, certain drawing to the attention uh, that uh, people in the media have, and I had that, and I'm kind of uh, I laugh about it today because uh, uh, I spent uh, a year or so in the media industry. I guess my first year after. Uh, after university and I kind of pretty quickly noticed that no actually I don't want to be in the media <laughs> I want to be as far away from the media as possible and um, it's a it's a weird world and the, uh, and so my my corporate career kind of ended there and I got involved in uh, in launching a startup uh, here in Sweden uh, with a couple of friends uh, it was very like uh, they asked me can you build an app and for some very strange reason, I said yes, even though I clearly couldn't. Uh, and then we ended up uh, on, a, on a quest uh, where we built, this was in 2010, uh, we built a, a service that does uh, location-based ads. Yeah, so uh, at that time, this was like after, just after the first Groupon hype. Um, and there was a lot of these uh, apps coming around. Uh, ours was probably the best one, and it is the one that survived and outlasted uh, a lot of uh, 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 prominent uh, competitors in different ways. I think there was a point in my life where I realized that running a startup, um, and, and in that company I was the CTO, um, so I wasn't uh, sort of uh, maybe the main driver, I was more, more the main builder. Um, I, it came to a point for me where I realized that, you know, um, building a company means uh, lots of uh, ulcers, right? And uh, I'm okay with ulcers, but uh, I somewhat felt that uh, maybe for something uh, bigger than discount codes. Um, yeah, and so uh, I kind of phased myself out uh, of that. Mm. Uh, that uh, I was working in another startup that went nowhere. Uh, and it kind of uh, fell down uh, uh, the Bitcoin uh, uh, rabbit hole um, back uh, around, the, I guess, uh, the, the year preceding the, the, the launch of Bitrefo. Um, my early Bitcoining was, uh, I think it's kind of, uh, I think many people today uh, uh, miss uh, a lot of uh, uh, the underbellies uh, of Bitcoin. And I think that in terms of my early education, I had lots of different influences, both things like, uh, well, I guess, you know, the early Andreas Antonopoulos videos, uh, I'm sure we, we were mm -hmm. all uh, listening to and sort of uh, um, uh, getting inspired by. But, but also, uh, like, I kind of very early on realized that there is also this other side of Bitcoin, uh, which is the sort of uh, the let's say disorderly side where like people are uh, you know a little bit uh, trollish and anonymous and uh, sometimes rude uh, and uh, 
um, seeing them uh, uh, like following their discussions. And this was like, uh, uh, if you if you know the like Bitcoin assets gang and the uh, Mircea Popescu and all of those guys that had some very weird uh, values, but I think it, it taught me very early on about uh, about uh, uh, Bitcoin being, you know, it's this tool, right? It's the money of enemies <laughs> and the money of uh, uh, people that don't uh, agree on, on anything, about anything else, even about super fundamental principles. And I think that that's uh, also, I think, something that uh, has helped me navigate uh, uh, along with, uh, uh, with my, uh, my Bitcoin journey to always, uh, you know, always uh, observe, uh, you know, what the, what do the, let's say, um, what's the opposite of like polite society, like the impolite society? <laughs> uh, what do what do they they say, and like what do those who are uh, currently out of favor? Uh, what are their points of view, and so on? And you don't, don't always have to agree with it, but but to observe that it's there, and so on. Um, and uh, I mean, at that time, there was a lot of, uh, I remember there was a lot of narratives about how like people who start Bitcoin companies are, uh, are all stupid uh, because they're all going to get uh, hacked and, and robbed uh, and so on um, because uh, of all of this vague, uh, um, vague stuff uh, that, uh, that is out there uh, in this uh, uh, wild west uh, of an industry in which we still in some ways are <laughs> um, and I think that was a bit of a motivator to to building the first version of Bitrefill I was also kind of like catching up on my programming skills um, and learning uh, learning Node.js uh, and uh, I figured uh, that I would build something uh, something uh, sort of uh, small uh, as a project to Sort of, uh, I remember thinking that okay, I'm gonna get scammed or hacked. Uh, let's make sure that I get scammed or hacked in a small scale, uh, so that I can learn the lessons uh, and then evolve from it. Right? It's better to be to be hacked now for a smaller amount, so that I can learn from it and maybe not get uh, get hacked uh, at, the, at the later stage. And so the the original version uh, of BitRefill, we're actually uh, today uh, uh, celebrating six years. Uh, on the day from uh, the first uh, uh, first transaction uh, on Bitrefill that wasn't uh, uh, myself uh, or uh, somebody uh, in the surroundings. Um, so, so I was gonna say maybe so, it might make sense to kind of uh, at this point. And by the way, we we need to talk. I was looking through your Twitter feed, and we need to definitely talk about PayPal. Uh, you know, the 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 pink elephant in the room. But before we do. Why don't we just do a baseline on on bit refill and what the offering was is you know I don't sure. know maybe aims to be maybe that's a little too far but you know what I mean yeah sure I mean I think bit refill is uh, I tend to talk about startups it's a little bit like children like some children are planned by the parents where some just kind of happen <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, and it's uh, there's no real uh, uh, with companies it's similar like some companies are very planned uh, you know like a group of founders sit down and we're going to make a company and this company is going to do this and they're okay here we go you now whereas other companies are like somebody launches a proof of concept it takes off uh, customers are requesting this and then you do that and then, so and so on the snowball starts rolling. And, and Bitrefill is definitely in the in the latter uh, category in in a lot of ways. Um, I think that the direction of Bitrefill has always been uh, been the same, yeah, but the practical aspects of what we do has, has varied quite a bit. Um, so from a big picture, the direction is uh, is is enabling, like uh, enabling people to do stuff uh, with uh, with their crypto. Um, today, most of our users are using Bitrefill to buy gift cards and then use those gift cards to buy uh, anything that they want uh, from, uh, from e-commerce uh, services. And so this has a lot of, uh, this has a lot of benefits uh, uh, for somebody uh, compared to, say, selling your Bitcoins on an exchange and withdrawing them to your bank and so on. Uh, shopping with your coins uh, is, uh, uh, is not a... 
uh, in itself a regulated activity, uh, which means that uh, we can allow things like uh, people buying stuff on the site without having an account uh, at all, uh, which means that we're a, a better uh, option from a privacy standpoint. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're a good option from a price standpoint because uh, we we buy the gift cards in bulk, and so we get a, a discount, and that means that uh, you can, you know, if you buy a hundred dollar gift card, uh, you usually pay hundred dollars for it, and sometimes you even get some uh, sats back for uh, for your next purchase and so on. Um, so that's uh, kind of what we're doing right now. Um, what we did back then, uh, when Bitrefill was a, a sort of side project uh, that took off, uh, was that we're working primarily with phone refills, uh, which is something that we, we still do. Um, phone refills, um, so to zoom out, globally, uh, there's more uh, phones uh, active in the world than there's people. Right. So at, at this point, uh, almost everybody in the world, uh, even uh, poor people, uh, have a cell phone. And there's more people that have cell phones than uh, have toothbrushes uh, in the world. Uh, and out of these uh, uh, cell phones, 70% uh, are prepaid like in, in most of the world, including, uh, including in India. Um, most people, you know, they, they just don't have the credit worthiness or the infrastructure to get a subscription and whatnot. And, and so it's everything is on a prepaid model. So globally, there's 5 billion with a B people that uh, uh, that have a prepaid phone. And so the original bit refill uh, uh, phone refill functionality was that you, we would accept your, uh, your bitcoins and we would uh, exchange that for a refill uh, of your prepaid phone balance. Right. And so that was and in some countries still is like the, the only thing uh, that you can actually buy uh, with your bitcoins, uh, and so um, and that was kind of what got it to take off in the in the beginning. Uh, that we, you know, I just launched this with a third party API for doing the phone refills, and um, and noticed that uh, um, that uh, we get customers uh, from uh, a very broad uh, assortment of, uh, of countries. You know, it was uh, the, uh, the South Asian countries. Uh, there was uh, uh, customers from Africa, from Europe, from Eastern Europe, from, from Latin America, from the US. Um, and, and that kind of triggered this, uh, you know, reading up on phone refills and, oh, there is 5 billion with a B people. And here we can enable with relatively little effort yeah, a meaningful amount of uh, functionality for all of these people. Um, and so that was the first configuration of Bitrefill. Over time, as we added gift cards for uh, e-commerce services and so on, yeah, we've noticed that uh, yeah, it grows uh, uh, even faster. And so uh, we're focusing a bit more on the gift cards right now, but definitely still uh, keeping the phone refills up uh, because in a world where uh, where uh, using Bitcoin uh, is as common as using video calling, for example. And in that world, uh, the phone refill business with, with an addressable market of 5 billion people uh, is actually uh, uh, quite huge. But we're not quite there yet. So yeah, that's a little bit how, how we think about that stuff. So just so, to sum up, so I yeah. was going to say, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, I was going to say, so, but so far you were saying, so, um, your initial offering was uh, an offering where people could top up their cell phones or like pay their cell phone uh, minutes with Bitcoin, right? And when, when, when did you guys start that again? That was back in- uh, In the end of 2014. So, uh, end of 2014. Six years ago. And then, and then now it sounds like there's this like gift card offering, right? Um, that is kind of the main product. Right. And how, how, what's, what's been the, the traction like on that front? And I mean, yeah. it seems super clever because you're right, because you're kind of taking care of, you know, one half of the, uh, the equation. Like the only reason people need to even take money into their banks is so that they can spend it eventually. So right. you can go straight from Bitcoin to stuff. Uh, then you can just stay in Bitcoin. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, 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 and this is what we're doing. Uh, and uh, Love uh, it. the more that we enable, uh, you know, a lot of the benefits uh, of, of Bitcoin or even broader crypto, if you, if you so prefer, uh, a lot of the benefits only materialize uh, once uh, 
uh, once you're able to stay uh, in in that layer right uh, mm. i mean currently for most people their uh, their bitcoin experience is like you buy an exchange uh, and maybe transfer it to a cold wallet and then when you sell you send it back to an exchange and you sell it but and that's like uh, and, and now with uh, paypal and same with uh, revolut uh, they kind of even shortcut it because then at that point i mean what what's the point you can just buy it uh, without ever having access to your, your coins and then you sell it on the same service and you never saw your coins and there's no risk of you getting hacked or anything but it's not bitcoin right and we we kind of sense that it's not yeah and i sometimes draw the analogy of uh, like um, you could uh, explain to somebody uh, if email wasn't a thing until now and you had to explain to somebody what email is and you told them that you know you can write your letter uh, with a pen and paper you can take a picture of it with your phone you can send it as an email and then the other guy can print it and then they can read your letter uh, then it was email <laughs> right uh, email happened um, some there were some benefits of doing that versus sending a snail mail but a lot of the benefits of, of digital communication are kind of lost uh, mm. when you always have to go through uh, those uh, uh, those uh, entry points and, and so I, I sometimes feel like uh, the the crypto industry is in that phase uh, yeah, a lot of times with the, with the changes uh, that it's always like you know, okay you have to go through a regulated exchange on and then you have to go through a regulated exchange uh, off uh, and uh, you know and if, if that's the case then yeah then we haven't actually succeeded in in building an independent network which I think is valuable. Very interesting. Very interesting. Hey, so I, I guess you kind of touched on it with the other references, but what are your thoughts on the PayPal news today? How do you think that impacts, I guess, your, your business? How do you think it impacts the kind of the industry at large? So, uh, and I guess there's going to be a delay uh, between uh, when this is aired and when we're recording it. Uh, so maybe I'll be, uh, I'll look stupid even on the first day, but from what I've been able to read so far is that they're actually not going to enable you to uh, to withdraw your coins or deposit coins or anything. You can just uh, uh, convert like you have currencies on PayPal. Uh, you can have euros and dollars and GBPs, and now you can have BTC uh, there, uh, right? And so this uh, this is helpful for maybe for the people who just want uh, the price of Bitcoin to go up. But even that too is kind of. Uh, um, uh, it's not as even as certain that it will drive the price up because like, we don't know if, you know, if uh, uh, part of the Bitcoin thing is that there's only 21 million and we don't know how many Bitcoins PayPal sold, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, just as we don't know with, uh, with many of the, uh, the large custodians and so on. And so I think that, I mean, it's uh, obviously, uh, it's a good sign that the big companies are, are starting to pay attention yeah, to to our field, uh, I think that uh, the world is going to be uh, more interesting, and I think eventually they will enable deposits and withdrawals. Uh, we'll see when it happens, but at the same time, uh, I don't know. It's not like uh, uh, companies like PayPal have been leading uh, innovation in uh, financial services uh, in a big way, so. Yeah, I don't know. I think that my my life experience has taught me that when big companies uh, enter a field, people are always like, "Ooh, this is going to change everything." Uh, in practice, usually it doesn't, uh, because at first it takes the big company a long time to figure out what, what this even is, uh, and you know what this uh, field is, and um, uh, and after that, like aligning that with their other priorities and so on. Yeah, it's, it's difficult for them. And I think we see it with uh, the extensive list of criteria uh, that they put uh, on, uh, on holding Bitcoin on PayPal that, uh, that it's, uh, I don't know who would hold their coins on, uh, on PayPal. Uh, and I don't know who in uh, of the sort of, the, the Bitcoin world is, is based on, uh, on, on, uh, on chains of trust. Uh, right, and even uh, the newbiest of noob probably trusts uh, either some uh, thought leaders on, on 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 the internet, or even has some 
friend who is a little bit more savvy and so on. And from all of their perspective, I think uh, anybody in the right mind would tell them to, you know, if, as soon as you can try to get actual Bitcoins instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, this locked in PayPal thing, because we just don't know uh, where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, what I think is that I, I think that it's, it will have less of an impact. Uh, uh, like the impact has already happened. Like we, mm. uh, the impact is press release, right? And it's the same impact as we had in 2014 where the press releases were so-and-so accepts Bitcoin payments, right? Mm. It was also just a press release uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, and we got the press release and okay, yeah, we got the press release. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, and uh, people uh, retweet and so on. But uh, in practice, I think it doesn't change much. So, so, um, so just to kind of shift gears. So the, the next one I was going to ask you about was kind of like, what's that one, you know, thing that you believe that most others in, you know, Bitcoin would disagree with you on. And, and I think your kind of company's narrative feeds into that, but, but just, just curious, do you want to kind of pick up on that thread? Sure. I mean, there is, a, uh, there is a certain narrative in, uh, in certain subsets of the Bitcoin Twitter that, uh, you know, you shouldn't buy stuff with your coins, right? And, and a lot of this, uh, I think, uh, comes back to the, the scaling conflict that there was in 2017 and that there were some of the companies like, uh, like BitPay and so on that were arguing for a hard fork in order to, to make it easier for people to do my small transactions and so on. And, and so a lot of people uh, went to the side of that, uh, you know, went from the side of uh, uh, it's not worth uh, uh, compromising the core values to enable uh, this use case better, but they kind of went too far and sour grapes that all the way uh, to be like, no, you shouldn't even uh, try to buy stuff with your coins. Like, and, and so this has developed into this narrative where people are like, uh, for example, bringing up, uh, I mean, Laszlo, uh, who bought uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pizzas uh, for 10,000 BTC in 2010, that, oh, you know, since Bitcoin goes up in, uh, in price, that that means that you're going to regret it. Uh, because the coins that you spend today are going to go up tomorrow, right? And so, uh, in the, uh, and, and so the, but in practice, that just t says that they're arguing for people to, uh, to live on fiat, <laughs> basically, right? Because you have to eat, like you have to buy food and so on. So, and, and that means that they're arguing for people uh, to, uh, to uh, first of all, you know, uh, keep their uh, their fiat life as much as possible, uh, to hold uh, Bitcoin as a speculative investment. Um, they often argue for uh, for people to, <clears throat> you know, there's oftentimes uh, a neglect for uh, for privacy and, and, and those values uh, from uh, from that community. Uh, whereas from my point of view, is that. I mean, look, I would never tell somebody to sell their Bitcoins uh, and I'm not even arguing that people should sell their Bitcoins. Uh, we're just providing a service uh, that uh, if you decide to sell Bitcoins for whatever reasons, it's none of mine nor your business, right? Lots of people have lots of reasonings going on in their life. And uh, we provide a service that makes, uh, 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 that's a better offering for when uh, you decide to, uh, to sell your coins, that you can uh, have all of those uh, benefits uh, of price and convenience and, and privacy and so on that we discussed. Yeah. By the way, can I buy right. food? The, can I buy food? Like, uh, like meaning, are there? Can I get like uh, gift cards sure. to food? Yeah. W which, like, what brand? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of people that li that live uh, like uh, literally live on Betrayful. Um, you have uh, first of all, there's the different uh, food delivery services. Um, so you can get like uh, in the U.S. there's uh, uh, Uber Eats and so ah. on. Um, oh my god! But goodness. we also and Grubhub <laughs> and and so on. But we also like uh, have uh, yeah, for specific chains. You know, we have uh, Burger King, Chipotle, and uh, a bunch of different restaurants. And we have Whole Foods and Walmart uh, and so on. If you wanna just you know buy groceries and so on. 
so you can you can buy a lot of stuff uh, on uh, on Bitrefill, and lots of people do. And, and are so you able to share? Are you able to share users and stuff like that, or number of users, or I guess that, uh, that you guys keep that kind uh, of under the hood. Yeah, we're keeping that a little bit uh, uh, close to the chest uh, mm. for now. I'd say this: compared to exchanges, we're much smaller. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, compared to uh, the volumes with user counts of, uh, of uh, companies like Kraken or Coinbase and so on, uh, we're you know, I, I don't know, orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, but we're growing. Uh, we've been uh, uh, profitable uh, uh, since. The six months, uh, which is cool. Uh, we're growing very steadily, uh, especially, I guess, during times when, when Bitcoin is going up. Uh, that means that our customers are a little bit richer and uh, shopping a little bit more. Um, but uh, even regardless of that, uh, we're uh, growing quite a lot. Like we uh, published a tweet, uh, uh, we had a you know, big sales day uh, last week, uh, where we sold more in one day than two years ago we had sold in an uh, entire month. Crazy. So, uh, so uh, we're growing at a good pace, uh, and uh, more and more people are kind of realizing uh, the value of uh, of living in crypto, um, and the, uh, and the benefits of that versus living on fiat, uh, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and that's kind of what uh, what I think. Uh, uh, is uh, something that I believe in that uh, um, that maybe not all Bitcoiners do. And maybe I should also elaborate a little bit more, like on why I think it's, it's the, there is like an importance I think in also um, in in fostering a crypto economy, uh, right? Uh, in uh, uh, because uh, uh, shopping with coins uh, from a crypto company uh, also means that that company will keep their uh, maybe at least. But we do uh, keep profits and pay salaries in, in bitcoins, right? Which which feeds uh, uh, the economy, the, this little virtual country that we're all uh, that we're all building, and it participates in uh, in creating um, creating the world that uh, we would like to see. Uh, and gift cards are, uh, you know, it's a uh, it's a bridge technology. Like at the end of the day, we want to just pay with your bitcoins everywhere and so on. But um, we we need to be mindful that even though sort of our ambitions are there, but currently the transactional crypto space is small, right? And so it, it doesn't really make sense for uh, for the big brands to start working on their uh, crypto integration uh, services. Just if yet. you've got Uber Eats and Walmart. <laughs> I mean, that you can, covers you can. probably most people's like you know basic uh, yeah. living living uh, requirements. Absolutely. What about like? We can you cover Amazon like? Is there is there a, clothes, is there a way to uh, pay rent? Else. Like you need money in your bank, right? But I, I wonder if there that's are like the, that's the part that is uh, more difficult for us. And mortgages uh, and things uh, like that. Uh, I guess that's the part where you're gonna need the bank, right? Yeah. Obviously. And that is uh, that is financial services, uh, mm. which is something that you also have like credit card. Do. Like credit, can you pay off your credit card or something like that? Not really, right? Yeah, uh, no, currently no. Uh, but uh, mm. but it is something that we're thinking uh, about. We're exploring uh, absolutely, but it's a big step for us because we're up until now have only been doing things that aren't financial services. And so uh, starting to do financial services, it requires a couple of changes in the company and so on. But it's, uh, I mean, but it how is do you get there? How, how do you get to that end vision? You know, you were saying earlier how you're not like you guys offer gift cards. You started with phone uh, top up. You know, you're thinking about maybe integrating with some of these like, uh, you know, payment processing, uh, you know, kind of whatever uh, entities. What's your, I mean, how do you foresee, you know, Bitcoin Kind of like getting to the masses, where I guess I mean, pay, pay, well, no, PayPal, PayPal, like you said, there's some drawbacks there, right? But like, how, how does, how do entrepreneurs in the space, you know, or yourself, how are you thinking about actually making it so that you never need to go into fiat? Well, I think that, I think that an important part of understanding, uh, uh, understanding crypto especially as opposed to the uh, fiat system is that crypto is it's about open networks an open network just like the web and so an open network means that you don't need to provide 
uh, everything for everybody, right? Uh, uh, in the in the old world, uh, you know, you, uh, with the bank and whatnot, you get you need to get your salary to the bank, and you have money in the bank. Uh, bank is tied to your uh, payment card, and you pay rent, and, and everything goes right. And so the bank needs to be uh, the full service. Whereas in the crypto world, what we're seeing is is, is, is massive unbundling. And I think we're only seeing a start of it where different services and people that live on crypto, they use different services for different things. And so I think that obviously as a business, we should strive to, you know, provide as many people, as many services as we can. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, it's not, we're a part of the Bitcoin network. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, and there will be other parts of the big network. That, that's what makes it a, a network. Uh, and so if we provide this and somebody else provides that and we're interoperable, then gradually uh, uh, there is a suite uh, 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 evolving uh, of tools and utilities that uh, the people use to, to live on crypto. And so I think um, we've also been doing a lot of uh, uh, Cool stuff with uh, with lightning technology, and I think that that kind of ties into that as well. And yeah, because uh, like from from our standpoint, uh, is that um, lightning is probably that technology that is going to tie all of these things even uh, even tighter uh, and make the user experience uh, even better. Um, and if we can sort of uh, you know. Uh, build as much real estate in the transactional uh, crypto as we can. Yeah, and that would be a good thing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, just like, how do you, uh, cause I know you guys were doing some pretty forward thinking things along the lines of lightning and, and helping others kind of get uh, up to speed with it as well. And so, um, so yeah, what, what do you recommend, you know, for other like exchange owners and just like companies in the space in terms of like, what do they need to do uh, to, to kind of, you know, get, get, get going with this, the whole lightning movement. Cause that's also, you know, like an open network type of yes. thing. And, and the more people you have participating, the better. I would say, I would say, look, uh, 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 it's very simple advice. Yeah. Just fucking do it already. Yeah. And, and that advice is, uh, it's based on that there is this sentiment this is maybe another thing in which I disagree with many Bitcoiners. There is a sentiment that Lightning is this complex thing. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, yeah, it has to do with how we as a, as a community sometimes celebrate uh, complexity. Uh, and we celebrate things that don't really work yet. right? And then we talk about this thing. Uh, it doesn't work yet, so it's exciting. And imagine when it works uh, and, and, and so on. Yeah. And, and that this created this weird feeling where a lot of exchanges uh, feel like, yeah, we don't know if we have the skills to integrate Lightning. I mean, come on. At the end of the day, it's like you run another daemon uh, next to your Bitcoin D, uh, you, you connect endpoints for deposits and withdrawals and you're done. Like it, it's, not, uh, it's not fundamentally uh, all that different uh, from, uh, from uh, running uh, a Bitcoin node uh, or an altcoin node and so on. And, and I think that the, the, this has gotten to this weird point where, I mean, you know, we still as an industry, like I, I don't remember who it was recently, but like some company announced that they supported SegWit and people were like cheering it. And like, guys, like that was maybe, maybe interesting in 2017, but <laughs> arguably not even interesting then because it's like, it's a tech thing that, that doesn't, yeah, it doesn't affect anyone, but it's definitely not something worth cheering in, in, in 2020. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of people are kind of overhyping um, how, how difficult uh, it is uh, to, uh, to integrate Lightning. Um, I think that um, one thing that I think I've learned and one of the values that we have at, uh, at BitRefill uh, which I think makes us a fun company to, to, to work with, uh, blink, blink, um, to the audience, uh, is that, you know, a lot of times in the crypto world, especially, we talk about this complex pie in the sky stuff in some type of future that we dream of. And me personally, I prefer to, to think of, like, 
okay, sure, we have this pie in the sky thing, but what if we take it uh, and if we want to expose it to real customers with <laughs> real money today, like, okay, uh, what can we actually do with it uh, today? Uh, are the trade-offs that need to be taken and can we take them? Um, and, uh, you know, hey, let's uh, introduce it to, uh, to some customers and start getting feedback and, and, and learning uh, about uh, what it is that, you know, which, again, which assumptions that we thought uh, were working, which assumptions uh, that uh, uh, we thought were not working and, and so on, right? And that in my world, tech is interesting when, uh, exactly when it starts being uh, being used uh, in the real world, like uh, with real money and so on, uh, not just uh, you know on testnet, uh, which you know isn't even a good thing because testnet doesn't behave like mainnet <laughs> for obvious reasons because it's not real money, <laughs> right? And so uh, yeah, I was gonna ask you. So what what what's you all see? Because I mean, recently there's been all these like public companies, you know, taking stakes in Bitcoin. I'm just curious. Like, have you been following that that trend a bit? And do you think it, it's meaningful, or is it just another like, you know, news hype thing like that we were going through? Or do you think this is this signifies something? I don't know, transformational. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's pretty it's, cool. It is pretty cool. I mean, it talks about. Uh, uh, I mean, the price of Bitcoin is uh, simply a fun function of people and entities who think that it's valuable. And so if uh, uh, companies uh, communicate that in a public way, then, uh, then that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, all, all for it. I don't know what to say. Um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's not fundamentally different from, you know, say a billionaire buying a bunch of Bitcoins, uh, right? And they sometimes do and sometimes they sell and, you know, hey, uh, we build our thing and uh, I think the, the price uh, growing reflects uh, that uh, more people over time uh, see it as uh, as valuable and, and that's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so curious just to just to kind of move on to the, the one of the other questions here, which was uh, so the same type of question is in what contrarian belief, but like, do you have any that as it pertains to the world at large, like outside of our Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain space, like you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, obviously, but are there are there certain things that you think most people are kind of like on the bandwagon about, and you're just like on the other side of the fence, looking at them, going like, oh, there's they're, they're still not here yet. <laughs> just curious. Yeah, that's a good, uh, uh, good question. Uh, ah, lots of stuff, but I, I don't know if it's that controversial in, uh, in the in, in the Bitcoin world, you know. But like, I don't know if you necessarily will get a good. Uh, I mean, the, getting a good understanding of the world is difficult. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, uh, because uh, all media has different types of biases, and we don't really know what incentives are working in which direction and so on so it's uh, it's tricky to get uh, an accurate uh, understanding of the world um, I think that that's probably not a controversial thing in the uh, in, the, in the Bitcoin community. Wait, wait, wait. Well, you said what? You said it, it's tricky to get <clears throat> uh, what? Are you saying there's just like a, a like an abundance of information? Well, I mean, you, like, you kind of like take, you don't know if it's real or politics, fake. And so... uh, like if you look at American politics, mm. but it's not just in America. Like there is fundamental differences in in terms of not just about values, but in terms of like understanding the state of the, uh, how the world is. Right. I mean, uh, if you uh, if you take your average uh, Trump supporter and your average uh, 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 Democrat supporter, like and discuss like objective, like what is the state uh, of you know th there's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going to fundamentally disagree on, right? And so we, we're in a world where there's like massive disagreements on like the nature uh, the nature of the world, not just about values and what should be, but also about uh, about what it is, and I think that, that there's a lot of uh, tensions uh, uh, coming out uh, out of uh, uh, out of all of that. Um, and I don't know, like uh, I don't know if that's uh, uh, yeah in the uh, in this audience. I think it's not very contrarian, but I think that's kind of also the thing is that being a part of the Bitcoin audience is uh, contrarian to, uh, to the outside world. <laughs> 
I guess uh, maybe I can uh, can elaborate a bit more. I am. Uh, yeah. I think that one thing that that I believe in is that sometimes I believe in that there are things that yeah uh, that are better that everybody knows of yeah uh, but doesn't doesn't uh, sort of uh, uh, doesn't act on um, yeah, or doesn't know enough and um, things that are blatantly there yeah, but that most people kind of ignore well maybe yeah, an example so, or like i don't know well, well i mean bitcoin is the best example right mm. everybody knows that there is bitcoin right mm. uh, but but there is only a small subset of uh, the population that uh, that actually you know uh, believes on it to the extent that they're betting their money on it mm. right? most mm. people aren't mm. right and so uh, and there is a lot of these things uh, where uh, uh, where uh, this audience uh, um, and there is a lot of, uh, I guess, similar things in terms of nutrition, right? This is also why uh, the Bitcoiners uh, uh, have different of these. Uh, you should only eat keto or, or, or meat or whatever, right? It's a similar type thing in, in that you know, lots of people know that. Oh, you could only eat meat, or you know, LCHF has been known since forever, right? But only some people actually uh, believe on it so much that they start acting on it and i think that i believe that there are th these things that that are there in plain sight uh, but that most people just uh, don't pick it up sort of i have a question are you i just on that note i'm just curious are you are you into the keto thing like do you like try and do uh, like a mostly meat dominant uh i'm on the keto thing not on the uh, uh on uh, uh, the only meat thing yeah. Okay. Like, oh, okay. Got it. So you can do keto without just doing meat. Like, uh, so the idea yeah, is, is but, you just, what's the idea? You cut out sugars but, and, but, um, and, uh, and like yeah, and bread and things like that and carbs essentially. Right? Yeah. So I have a question. So, oh, but you still eat vegetables, obviously. All these vegetables. Yeah. You do eat but, vegetables. But again, I kind of like, I don't know, kind of like tried it out. I, I, I tried to be a little bit pragmatic with this stuff also because it's easy to sort of Go off follow the deep along end. <laughs> on a, uh, well, uh, fall along into a rabbit hole, right? Right, right, right. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily the case that all of these things always are better, right? We definitely have a lot of groupthink uh, in in our community. Because I, I, so, uh, yeah, so it's important here as well to sort of, you know, to to evaluate these things, to try it out, uh, and not just believe blindly in uh, things that are popular in in our subset of Twitter. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally agree. No, because like, I'm all into meat. Don't get me wrong. My, I, we just got like a barbecue this past weekend as well. So we're barbecuing like all the time. But, um, but I did, I did read a book by, uh, you know, you know George Saint Pierre, like the 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 UFC fighter. No, he's like, anyways, his coach was talking about essentially like the importance of just having a very like heavy vegetable kind of portion diet instead of meat. And, and the main reason against eating meat was that it was like cancer causing. And, you know, if your goal is to like live long, then, you know, it doesn't make sense to, but so I wasn't sure if that, if that, if that's true or if that's been debunked or you never know. It's so hard to keep up with science, yeah, you know, it's, it's just eat a little know. bit of everything. Uh, <laughs> no, nobody really knows. And the, you know, the wise men are, are debating these things. Right? And there, there, are, you go. there are wise men on one side and there are wise men on the other side. Uh, I mean, for me, this whole things uh, with the food stuff started, I guess, pre Bitcoin, uh, uh, I read this book about like not eating gluten and bread, and so I started doing the gluten-free thing. And that book has since been debunked as uh, pseudoscience, mostly. <laughs> right? But yeah, but when I did it, I I perceived that I felt better. It's always uh, hard to know. Um, I I do know that I when I, when I started doing keto uh, properly now two years ago, I did lose a lot of weight, uh, and so uh, that I think is. Uh, yeah, it, it's the big Helpful. signal, right? And that's mm. the thing is that you, okay, you, you, you try a thing uh, and uh, if it works, it works uh, if it has some type of measurable uh, outside results. And, and then, you know, I can never still uh, prove that, uh, hey, it was the keto thing, because it might be just that, you know, following a certain diet makes you more aware 
uh, of uh, what you uh, what you eat, or that it leads to eating less candy, uh, or uh, you know that lots of unhealthy stuff uh, that you eat is often attached to bread uh, in some form, <laughs> um, and and so like just cutting cutting out bread uh, helps a lot. It's hard to know. Um, a lot of times, it's also, I guess, that I've uh, I've learned is that uh, a lot of times it's better to have uh, a method and follow that method than picking the the best method. Right? Yeah. Similar with uh, with exercising, like there's a lot of different programs, mm. uh, and I would say that probably any particular one of those programs, if you if you pick it and you just stick to one. it, just do it. <laughs> if you pick one and stick to it, and it's going to be better than you know just showing up sometimes at the gym and doing uh, uh, whatever. Right. So, so I, I had a question for you. So, so okay, running a Bitcoin business is obviously hard and stressful, right? And most people, I find, like, are are plagued with anxiety, especially nowadays, right? They're cooped up at home. So, what? So, exercise, diet. I think we touched on a couple, but like, what are some like anxiety hacks that you deploy in your life? I'm curious to know. Like, do you journal? I don't know. Do you wake up early? Do you do meditation? Like, well, how do you kind of like, when you start feeling, you know what I mean? In that like weird place, how do you get out of it? Good question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess the answer is you succumb to it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Yeah, I <guess. laughs> Well, I mean, to some extent, uh, there is truth to that because when you're running a company, you always have some anxiety, right? Uh, it can yeah, be yeah, yeah. Big things or small things. But there's always something that is like, ah, you know, because you're you're kind of yeah, always uh, running up against uh, uh, against comfort zone, and you're always like hiring somebody, and you're you know discussing those things, or you're you know making a change uh, and uh, you know, dealing with the team. Politics. There's a lot of these things that you kind of uh, always uh, kind of uh, uh, pushes you. I think uh, I don't know if there's anyone who is uh, uh, running a startup and feeling comfortable about life. <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, uh, part of the thing. Uh, if it is, I would listen to their podcast. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, okay, okay. So I think I don't. You know, we got through. We got through a lot of questions. Yeah, I had a couple of like extra. If you have a bit more time still, I have a couple of extraneous kind of uh, random questions that you know stuff that I think about, and I'm just curious to know other people's perspective on. One is AI. Uh, ha- have you looked at this thing? Uh, do you have any concerns around it? Are you? Uh, do you, just, do you just think it's all blown out of proportion and people are watching too much Terminator 2? Like, where are you on the spectrum of this, like, AI thing? So you think, yeah. I, I had a moment where uh, I was at uh, some uh, startup pitch event this was a couple of years back, um, three years or so, and then I was presenting Bitrefill and so to an audience of, like, you know, not Bitcoin investors. Uh, and then there was another guy uh, who was... Uh, 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 pitching a startup that did something with uh, uh, with AI, and then there was like in the Q and A section, uh, they were asking him about uh, uh, about IBM's Watson, and he was like talking about how AI is really it's it's just a fancy word for uh, uh, for statistics, right? And then there's somebody asked him about Watson, it's like <laughs> Watson, it's like a fucking piece of shit that doesn't really do anything, and and it was so interesting because the way that he would talk about IBM's AI product. It's very similar to how I would talk about a, a, a IBM's blockchain product, right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and, it, yeah, and we kind of bonded over that. In in that, you know, we're also in a field where there's this uh, this fancy uh, a blockchain world word uh, that doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> uh, very much. Yeah, and uh, uh, and uh, there's like <laughs> these big companies that show up and try to do stuff, uh, and it's not clear what, but probably they're just trying to collect consulting revenues. Yeah, and uh, that there is this uh, this vague sort of uh, buzz uh, around it, uh, whereas in reality there is a much smaller part that is actually interesting, right? And, and I think it's exactly the same way in AI. That there is definitely something there that is very interesting. Uh, just as uh, there is something very interesting in crypto, um, but it's uh, it's uh, definitely not uh, elusive. <laughs> you know, the, the big thing 
you know, and, and stuff like, uh, you know, blockchain technology. So, so let's differentiate. So there's yeah. narrow bands of AI, right? So my Tesla right. drives itself, uh, you know, Google could be argued as a form of Bitcoin could be argued is, right. you know, kind of AI ish. But, uh, but what I'm talking about is like Raymond Kurzweil shit, like the singularity sure. is near, like the, the, the point where a thousand dollar of computer processing can, you know, it, it can do more processing per whatever second than humans can. And then eventually a year, a couple of years later, it's like more than humanity. And it's just like, you get to the point where where these devices can just compute at a hell of a lot faster than us. I'm just curious, is there a tipping point where, you know, I spent eight, 10 years in robotics before I got into Bitcoin. Um, I've been in all the major kind of robotics labs around the world. And that was 10 years ago. And it was fascinating to see how far, you know, all these like narrow bands are coming. But isn't there going to be one point where, you know what I mean? Like, like, like I said, okay, let's just take the car example. The car freaking drives itself, okay? In a couple of years, they're going to drive themselves like 100x better than the average human on the road. It already feels that way with me. Now, what, what, what happens when all the drivers are like not driving anymore because cars drive themselves? Are we going to tell them to become programmers? Well, look at OpenAI. If you look at the projects around OpenAI, people are literally designing things where natural language turns into code that turns into an app and you right. just like talk your way to this. So, so even that is going to become, I guess, somewhat uh, maybe obsolete. So, so my question is like, like, yeah, like, is there, is there something happening or is it like Luddite talk to be thinking that, you know, something of this nature could even be possible? Well, I mean, there is, again, this is an interesting parallel that there is a certain messianic uh, aspect to AI, just as there is with Bitcoin, right? Uh, that uh, we, we, in Bitcoin, we dream of the hyper-Bitcoinization and in, uh, in uh, AI, they dream of the singularity, right? Um, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not in any way an expert at AI. Uh, one thing I do know is that exponential growth uh, uh, is uh, uh, is always the first part uh, of an S curve, <laughs> uh, and when you're halfway through it, you always think that the exponential growth is going to stay exponential forever. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that exponential growth will stay exponential forever. I think that's the question with the uh, singularity idea: is like, w will it be uh, exponential forever, or like, will it be exponential until singularity, or will it taper off at some point, and we kind of see uh, a flatlining of uh, of technology where it's kind of stops uh, being uh, being interesting in in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, we're kind of getting to the point where, uh, like, if you buy a good laptop today, it's going to last you quite a long time, right? It's not. Uh, uh, it's becoming more and more like buying a watch. Uh, like, you buy a, a nice laptop is good handcraft, and then you can use it for many years. Right, uh, not like it was a couple of years ago when you like you buy a laptop and two years later you need to buy a new one. Um, and so, so I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm the wrong guy to, to ask. I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, one thing I heard on a pod uh, yesterday was a reasoning about uh, in terms of like AI taking over the world uh, is that uh, you know the paperclip uh, analogy. Uh, I guess if you've been in AI, like uh, the pa paperclip story is the, the paperclip making mesh AI that ends up destroying the world uh, because it needs the resources to make more paperclips, right? Uh, it's like a classic uh, uh, mm. such thing. And one thing uh, that I'm, I'm uh, wondering is whether or not we kind of have that problem uh, with uh, the algorithms uh, that control what we see on social media. Uh, in that uh, they are designed to optimize for engagement. Uh, and so uh, in their quest uh, with more and more AI, which is optimized for engagement, and we know that uh, things that enrage uh, also engage us. Uh, and so they, the AIs are uh, enraging us more and more. Uh, and what if it is the case that these AIs uh, drive us to, towards a, a civil war uh, or something else? Uh, just in their in their paper clippy way <laughs> of like uh, we're trying to achieve more engagement here, more clicks on the thing, uh, and, and and by accident it actually triggers uh, uh, triggers uh, uh, conflicts uh, 
uh, in the world. Well, you could, you could argue it. that it is. Yeah, you're, you could exactly. argue that it is. Exactly. But, uh, but like, how far would that go? Uh, mm. how, uh, you know, uh, how, how far... Um, I mean, the whole notion that there's different understandings of the world uh, is, uh, is scary. And because that is what leads to, uh, to big, uh, uh, big conflicts. Isn't that also what's made the United States the United States? Like these differing opinions and freedom of thought and, you know, just the fact that, I mean, to me, the right and the left is kind of the same thing, right? It's like uh, all smoke and mirrors to some extent. That's why I'm in Bitcoin. But I'm just saying like uh, chaos has always been somewhat a part of their history, you know, and and then and out comes, you know, Google and Apple and, and you know, all these like companies and, and entrepreneurs and whatnot. Um, Maybe, I don't know. I mean, we don't know. All of this is relatively new. I mean, the United mm. States is like, uh, <laughs> it's just one grand uh, experiment. We're like two, in a Petri dish. 200 uh, <laughs> something uh, years old. I mean, it's been running quite well so far, but you know, I guess, uh, uh, it's confusing to many Americans what's going on now. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's not that it's uh, all that much uh, less problematic in other countries. Like, my, 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 my parents were visiting us uh, just over the last few weeks. And just like two days ago, um, you know, the Canadian government's giving a lot of people money. And it's not like UBI, the universal basic income just yet, but it's kind of going there. And she was just like, oh, where is the government getting all this money? And I was like, that's the question like that's the question yeah. i've been asking for the last 10 years that's why i'm in bitcoin you see yeah. <laughs> and like the really light bulb. Like basic questions like this is questions that an eight-year-old will ask like where does money come from right and uh, uh crazy. And, and many kids probably at some point try you know they write a number on a piece of paper uh, and uh, they try to pass it off as money just like is this money and then it's like oh it's not money but why not Right, and, and it leads you down on these interesting questions, uh, in which the fiat system like doesn't have good answers a lot of the time. Yeah, and the, uh, and if the government can just print more money, why aren't they printing more money to give to the poor people so they don't have to be poor? I mean, the that, funniest thing is that's a good, thing good is, argument. <laughs> exactly. The funniest thing is they put pictures of themselves <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> and we all yeah. just pretend like it's sacred. It's awesome. It's like I mean, it's like religion 2.0 or something. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways. And it's kind of scary that we have several of these things where, again, the wise old uh, men uh, are, are uh, uh, in dispute, right? I mean, there are wise old men that say <laughs> that the, the, the fiat in modern mo monetary theory is totally going to work. And then there's others um, of the Austrian school that say it's, it's definitely not going to work and everything's going to go to hell. And like, they, they, there are arguments on both sides and we don't know. <laughs> and, and, and imagine like, I mean, literally like you're sitting in an airplane and there's like uh, one uh, professor uh, of av aviation that say like, this plane is totally going to crash. And another professor of aviation that says this plane is not going to crash. And it's like, how do you deal with that? <laughs> And, and we have that, like we, we have that with the monetary system. Maybe we have that with AI. Maybe we have that with the political climate. We have a lot of this uh, with the environment, uh, definitely. Uh, like with the climate question, uh, like, it's scary stuff. <laughs> it's scary stuff. Yeah, I have an, I have a weird random idea that maybe Bitcoin or something like Bitcoin can be used to keep tabs on this like this ai thing i was talking about i, I don't know what do you think that yeah, i'm gonna, yeah, I'm, gonna write, I'm gonna write a white, white paper on it <laughs> uh well wh why do i think i've written some vlogs about it i i think i think a lot of the problems that ai presents i feel can be addressed by blockchain so one just as by an example is uh ai thinks really fast and so fast that humans cannot simply keep up with it. I think not being able to understand how an AI comes to a decision is, is catastrophic. So I feel the fact that blockchains allow us to kind of create immutability and ways to store data in a way that they can't necessarily change easily, maybe could act as a, a so I think the fact that, you know, right now, okay, so data also kind of drives, this is number two is drives and kind of feeds off of data. If you think about it today, the data sits within the wall of five companies and two governments, really, most of it, right? So to me, that's super scary. Um, wouldn't it be nicer if we owned our own data and, and it didn't exist in like these centralized servers? So to me, again, that that 
sounds and feels a bit like, I know it's kind of the going into the blockchain <laughs> world, but that's why I said Bitcoin, right? Maybe, you know, I mean, I, I'm from Toronto originally, I mean, not originally, but I live in Toronto. And so I, I've known Vitalik and these guys for a long time. And and I, I've never been big fan, to be honest, like publicly of Ethereum, right? Um, and yet I've, you know, come around to some extent in terms of like, I feel like I got to eat my words because I, I, they are innovating to some extent, right? Like there are these decentralized exchanges. Like how can I hate on an idea like that, you know, when, you know, I do want commerce to be not, you know, centralized and whatnot. And so, 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 so I guess that I'm getting at, what am I getting at? What am I getting at? You know what? We've been talking for like a very long time. I just realized, I, and I'm thinking we're like, we have like 10 or 15 minutes left. I was going to ask you a final question, which was, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you wish I had? <laughs> yeah, I always uh, ask that question as well. Um, uh, uh, no, I, or I guess uh, I wish you asked me to ask you stuff. Uh, no. Okay, you, so shoot, yeah. you got, we got 15 minutes before your next meeting. So uh, if you want, I can, I can definitely answer some of those. Or, I mean, and, I should say, and, um, if you want, we could, if you're enjoying this and if it's interesting, we could... Uh, we could uh, do another one as well, a week, two weeks from now, yeah, a day from now, whatever well. you're free. Yeah. And, and, and we just kind of keep that one on the other side. But, but for now, any big pink elephant questions, hit me. Well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in, uh, I guess, uh, in uh, maybe in the, the unicorn uh, story, but maybe also especially on uh, like uh, the, the positive the developments that have happened there in the past. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Last year. Yeah. So I, I, so I, Okay, cool. So I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you my story and an Unicorn story in like a few minutes. Okay, right. just the highlights. Okay, born and raised, born and raised to East Indian parents, but I was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, which is in the west side of Canada. I spent the first 20 years of my life there, studied electrical engineering. Spent the last 20 years of my life in Toronto, in the eastern part of Canada. Minus, minus is like a. a uh, like a math equation, minus five years where I lived in India. Okay, so in 2011 to like 2015, 16, I, I lived in India. So the, my story goes, I studied electrical engineering. I felt I went first engineering job, there was more month at, than money, you know, at the end of the month, there was always more month than money. And I always like couldn't figure out, like, what this money thing was. And I always asked myself, like, what is money? And like you said, nobody could answer the damn question. I thought that the answer to that question would come in the form of me becoming a financial advisor in my part time. I literally started a financial brokerage, built that up, had like 20 or 30 licensed agents. We were helping family, helping families every day. And at the end of those couple of years, this is prior to 07, 08, I felt like I understood less about money than I did at the beginning of that journey. It was just like, it was like, what the hell? These people are like, they, they dress so nicely. They talk using big words. We're in these like fancy buildings. But when you ask them like basic questions, like what is inflation and what is money and where does it come from? They just can't seem to answer it. And so I felt disillusioned, left that space then spent eight years in robotics, helped outfit a lot of the major robotics labs. And then in 2011, I was living in India on behalf of that robotics company, discovered Bitcoin, fell down the rabbit hole, became like mega crazy obsessed for like six months, you know, read everything I could. And uh, and then when I kind of, you know, came out of my slumber, I, I started India's first, I guess you could say one of the first Bitcoin meetups, uh, which I'm really proud of. And so we used to do them every two weeks we used to meet up at like fancy hotels like the Lila Palace which is like the equivalent of like a seven star hotel right like it's insane and all of us would just get together you know we just put it on meetup and just get like bitcoiners together every couple of weeks how did, it, how did it end up since you ended up going back to India yes. so so the company the robotics yeah, I company I was with I helped them kind of build out North America Latin America and then finally the CEO one day, he was like this British guy, he's, he's like, this is so awesome. He, and he was like, Sonny, you know, you're, you're, I think you're pretty good at this whole, you know, business development, like, you know, sales thing. Why don't you head out to, um, to India? You know, I, I hear they've got, you know, lots of universities and 
robotics is a big thing. So why don't you head out there? And so I, I, instead of just like flying there, I was like, Paul, why don't you just give me a budget and I'll just go live there, which would be a lot better. And I said, she just moved out there for the company and started helping kind of like with IITs and NITs and uh, outfitting labs. But around then I got bit by the Bitcoin bug and, you know, became like super obsessed. My my first, like, uh, so we, we actually, when I met Satvik, who's the CEO of UnoCoin, um, and Harish and Abhi, my, my two other co-founders, these guys were pretty much like, we're like a match made in heaven because like, uh, like we would come up with ideas and they would just go and execute. So we ran like a Bitcoin mining rig. You know, we we did India's first big, big Bitcoin conference called the Global Bitcoin Conference at a Sheraton where we launched UnoCoin. We did like 10 other things, physical Bitcoins, this, that, whatever we could think of, we just did it. And then finally, we, it's like, you know, we took a scientific approach, I guess you could say, right? We had hypotheses, we tested them out and figured out what worked, what didn't. And then finally, we launched UnoCoin December 2013. Um, and before that, about a month or two before that, in preparation for this event, I got approached by this guy who was running a company called Buttercoin. They were like a Bitcoin exchange. I don't know if you remember them. And they were based out of Silicon Valley, backed by Google Ventures, Y Combinator, blah, blah, blah. It was like such a cool uh, company. And then they'd offered me a role to be their BD head. I worked there for a year. Then uh, then Barry invested in UnoCoin. And I was like, okay, shit, I got to like, like go back to this project I helped start. Um, and, and so, yeah. And then, you know, we've been kind of building it since 2013. It's been a really rocky road. Um, you know, there's been like, we'll, we'll make like Bollywood movies about it someday. But just to fast forward um, to like the, the more recent events, about two years ago in 20, I think 17, the central bank, the RBI. And by the way, the RBI, someone from the RBI even came to our event in 2013, December 2013. There's like a little story there as well. But uh, anyway, so December 2017 or around 2017, they wrote a notice on their website and they pretty much stopped allowing banks to deal with Bitcoin companies. So it was um, pretty devastating, you know. Um, yeah, it was crazy, man. It was like uh, we had to lay off almost 100 people, I think, a year and a half ago. It was, um, yeah, it was just a really sad time. And we challenged uh, the central bank in the Supreme Court. And so it was not just UnoCoin. UnoCoin was a big part of it. Um, like Uno Harish, one of our co-founders was like in the courtroom every day before anyone and was like essentially a part of the uh, the case itself. It was UnoCoin that helped fund a lion's share of, of the, the court case. It was our lawyer that we've had since December, 2013 that was like fighting the court case. I mean, we were pretty, uh, I'd say integrally kind of part of it. And, and when, when, you know, when, for the lack of a better word, when shit hit the fan, everybody else kind of, you know, <laughs> went elsewhere. And so there were a couple of companies left standing and, and, um, and even, you know, to my, to just to be very transparent, I mean, people know this, I, even two of us co-founders were like, well, what's the point in us sticking around? Uh, we're not lawyers and we're not, you know, building code or building businesses. We're, you know, fighting this fight in the Supreme Court against the central bank. And so I, uh, you know, uh, the Jesus Christ of Bitcoin, you know, Jesse Powell essentially just like said, hey, come, you know, help us out and, and work with us. I did. I worked there like in, in like it was like working for the Avengers for like a year. Um, and to my surprise, to some of our surprise, we ended up winning. And so the court case, you know, from uh, from like uh that took two years out of our, our timeline. We, the, all three judges uh, decided, you know, voted in our favor. So what, what does winning mean? Uh, oh, so, what, so, so what it says... means that the judges said that the notice on the central bank's website was unconstitutional and that the day after our banks were in Sutfix's home on a Saturday, signing us back <laughs> up and getting our banking back online. And it meant having banking again. It meant being able to serve our million and a half And how, what was uh, the attitude from the banks? I mean, it sounds like they were keen to get you back. Uh, I'm a little bit curious. I'm not 100% uh, sure about this, but why, I think one of the banks was on I our side. Heard. Yeah, I think one of okay. the banks was on, I don't know 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure one of the banks was on our side on this court case because they've seen the light. There's a lot of money to be made in Bitcoin if they didn't get the memo, uh, you know, they should because, uh, yeah, so, so, so our bank was never the problem, not in so India. I have another question. Um, what do you think, uh, from your understanding and from following this, uh, uh, this trial, uh, what was the main winning argument uh, that, uh, that led to your winning? 
So I, I, I can, like, yeah, 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 of course, of course. So there's, there's, okay. So there were five kind of like main points that are low and I can, I can send you a link on it. And by the way, there's the whole 200 page document is written in English and publicly available. Okay. It's just this whole Corona thing kind of overshadowed everything and people don't really mm -hmm. care, but, but I'll definitely share it or share it with you. Like literally what the, what the judges said. Um, but I've got like a five minute YouTube video also that summarizes the key five points that were brought up. Nice. Um, and, and, and yeah, and there's this lady who does the Tanvir has her name. She, she does a great job of summarizing it. So I'll, I'll share that with you and maybe even put it in our, um, yeah, just share with you over DM. Um, but, but I want to just share one thing. Cause you asked what I feel was one of the most important points. Um, I, well, so one of the fine, I'm kind of paraphrasing a lot here, okay? So like, this is like, there's a lot. Um, but after those five points were all kind of addressed, the judges said, okay, great. But you guys are saying that this this bank notice, this bank banning notice or whatever, right, is, is essentially unconstitutional. However, you know, we see an entity like the IAMAI, which was like the face that was fighting this whole fight on behalf of all the exchanges. We see, you know, an entity like that. We see companies behind that. We don't see where, like the constitution applies to people, okay? It, to an individual. And a lot of people maybe know, maybe don't know, but Uno coin about, you know, so when this bank ban came into place about a year and a half ago, we have, the best lawyers, like Nishit Desai and Associates are the best lawyers by orders of magnitude in India. They're like, uh, I'm not religious, but they're godlike, okay? Uh, yeah, so anyway, so they essentially helped us figure out how to do something in the absence of banking. Bitcoin, if you look at it from first principles, doesn't actually need a bank, your business being a prime example. So we yep. said, okay, our business is, is, is in the business of getting crypto in the hands of people. Um, you know, we also see, like for us as, as a business that, that deals with cash and, and money, we believe that, that doing KYC is kind of a hedge against, you know, regulatory like bans and whatnot. So for us, it was important. And we said, okay, why don't we maintain KYC, but then just deploy 300 ATM machines across the country and allow people to come in with their cash, to there, continue, go buy, sell, whatever you need to do, like carry on with your life. We ended up even going out and buying the same kiosks or the ATM machines that the banks launched. So we ended up buying the same, not like, oh, some whatever, whatever Bitcoin ATM. We bought the same freaking machines because we wanted to make sure there were no extraneous variables at play. However, however, due to all the confusion in the court case, due to literally like some police just not you know, knowing what they were doing, they ended up coming and taking our machine away. And for a day, even taking Satik and Harish away wrongfully, might I add. Um, and, you know, they, our lawyers had him out a day after. So I bring this up because that story and the hundred people firing and our livelihoods being affected were actually brought as um, an example. So it was Harish, one of my co-founders, who's kind of, you know, situation was brought as an example, as, as kind of the final um, straw, if you will. Um, but, but you know, I'll share the link with you in terms of like more the legal points. I think they're very, very valid. It's just that right now, or even if you want to do a, like I said, a follow-up call, you know, I can go deeper into all these things and yeah. kind of go through each of those points and we can talk about them, which I, Maybe I after I watch to... uh, After I watch the video, like mm -hmm. the reason why I ask is that in my experience, I mean, we've been doing this for six years and have different... Uh, uh, twists and turns uh, along the way and different focuses and so on. And one thing that I've noticed is that uh, in many cases, there are certain reasons why uh, that causes uh, uh, Bitcoin to take off in a big way in a country, right? And, 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 and I guess they can be summarized as some type of uh, lack of confidence in the currency financial system and so on. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, always a little bit different, a little bit, but then it's always a little bit the same similar at least uh, things. And, uh, and so one thing that we noticed uh, is that oftentimes after Bitcoin takes off in a big way in a country, like within a year or so, the, there is a ban. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and this, uh, I guess it's easier to see this happening in less democratic countries, uh, but it also does happen in democratic countries such as India. Uh, and I guess something that I'm thinking about is uh, like whether or not uh, there is a meaningful possibility of uh, 
uh, such a ban uh, happening uh, in a world where Bitcoin maybe starts taking off uh, in the USA. Um, uh, and uh, what that would look like and uh, what those uh, court cases would look like, uh, uh, would we be able to argue to uh, you know, an American Supreme Court that banning Bitcoin is unconstitutional, things like that. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, curious on your point of view on all of mm. this and if there's learnings from, yeah, uh, from the Indian you, story that can be applied. Well, India, definitely. Uh, and then also, Sergey, have you heard of 3IQ in Canada? 3IQ yeah. launched something called the QBTC, which is a fund that, that you know, tags itself for the Bitcoin price. Um, and it's listed on the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. I mean, Fred, uh, he had to go through a lot. I'm an advisor to 3IQ, you know, full disclosure, but he had to go through a lot um, to fight in court. You know, the OSC did not want, the Ontario Securities Commission did not want him to go um, you know, live with it and, and, uh, and he challenged them. And so I guess my, my learning, my learning is that, you know, th I could be mistaken, but I don't think there was anyone else, for example, in India, in the courtroom, aside from like, at least from not, not from a media side, but from like the exchange side, aside from Harish. Um, so my learning and, you know, whether it be on the three IQ side, Fred, and I know like countless stories, um, like this, where, you know, in the face of like massive adversity, entrepreneurs have simply stood up and have kind of, you know, challenged the system and they put their time, their resources, their personal relationships sometimes at stake. And, and all it took was that for them to fight back and do it in a very logical way with amazing lawyers, obviously. And, uh, and so what, I, what I've come to appreciate is, is that lawyers, or at least some of them are, are your friend. Um, yeah, that sounds like I can't believe I just said that. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, that makes sense. Um, but I, you know, at the, at the same time, I mean, there are a lot of countries where Bitcoin bans have happened where entrepreneurs haven't been able to, uh, to reverse it. Uh, yeah. Or so far, at least, you know, there's uh, both uh, in the, the India area, there's Pakistan. And, uh, and by, by the way, just to be clear, it, it was not a Bitcoin ban, as in like a Bitcoin countrywide ban. It was a Bitcoin banking ban, right? Just a little nuance. Sure. But, but, but I, I'd make that, I make that clarification. Like, yeah. It's similar, but I make that clarification because the government does have a narrative, kind of a line right now that's going on where they are trying to to ban. And, and, right. and one of the reasons I'm kind of doing, you know, and trying to meaning it, it's actually something that got set into motion years ago. Even the person who introduced it is now a pro kind of crypto Bitcoin person. So, and this thing was brought up in our court case and in light of it, they still move forward. So we don't think it has like a tremendous amount of weight, but one of the reasons I'm kind of doing YouTube videos and talking to people and just creating content is so that more people are like, oh my God, it's actually possible. Like, you know, like we should be building our own business or we should be working with companies. We should be doing things in this space. It's not like, oh, you'll never, it'll never work. Cause you know, you've got like, you know the powers to be at your kind of uh, coming after you type of deal. No, it's, it's not like that. It's like, like we're not doing anything wrong. Like, you know, it's like, it's just code. And it's just like, it's just like, yeah, it's just code. It's not just code. Yeah. It's not it's just not code. Just code. Uh, it's an the, idea. The I don't know what it is. <laughs> Right, but like we, we, there are you know prominent members of our community that have ended up in personal trouble with the law, uh, and so on, right? <laughs> and uh, and I think that uh, at some point there, there is something to be said for this uh, idea of like show me the man, I'll show you the crime, yeah, um, uh, right? Uh, and uh, I think that it's uh, uh, it's important to share these stories uh, and, and not to. Uh, you know, not to uh, uh, go too deep in the it won't happen here, um, because I think that it, these things can happen uh, in a lot of different ways in different countries. And I mean, from from what I see is that you know, if you want to stop Bitcoin, then probably the best thing is banning banks uh, from working with it. Yeah, that's well, that probably failed. A good attack point. That failed, and and that we don't think that that's failed, going to happen that's again. failed in India. Yeah, it's failed in India. India. Yeah, one out of every yeah, seven yeah. humans. You know, that's a little sizable amount, but still. <laughs> um, hey, Kraken! Kraken just became a f and bank, <laughs> like in the United right. States. I thought that was 
that's interesting. No, I mean, I don't want to say more, but just as a as a Bitcoin community enthusiast, I thought that was a big win. <laughs> So Absolutely. what I'm trying to say is PayPal, dude, PayPal, pay effing pal now. So I think, I mean, I know it's a bad thing in some ways, but as a Bitcoiner, that's a good thing, right? Like my mom knows PayPal, like, you know. Sure. Uh, no, I mean, so, I think it is important to have uh, the powers that be uh, be on board, right? And uh, like uh, stock exchange listed big companies uh, uh, supporting Bitcoin. Even if it's a logo only, like uh, that, that definitely is uh, is valuable. And when they have their Bitcoin and they want to spend it, they'll come to BitRefill. <laughs> hey, dude. Okay, so I, I'm already over my time. I want to be mindful of your calendar. I really enjoyed it. If you're down, we can do it again whenever next week. Uh, but, uh, but do you want to leave with kind of your, I don't know, whatever you want people to know, like just your, your Twitter handle, maybe your, your company website and all that kind of stuff? Ah, I'm at Zygamon on Twitter and at BitRefill and I'm sure you'll post uh, post links and, uh, yep. and whatnot. Uh, no, I have, uh, very much enjoyed this conversation. Awesome, uh, man. And, it, was, it was great. Uh, it was a... Look forward to continuing it. Uh, Definitely. Uh, so I'm just going to stop the recording here. Awesome, man. Right. Yeah.